Hello and welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. Feel free to use the chat box for any questions. If we are unable to get to them during the presentation, they will be answered at the end. My name is Braden Knutson. I will be your host for this webinar. Today we will be pleased to hear from James Tanner who will be giving a presentation titled Using the Google Goldmine for Genealogy. James Tanner has a bachelor's degree in Spanish and a master's degree in linguistics from the University of Utah. He received a Juris Doctor degree in law at Arizona State University. He served for two years as an intelligence analyst for the U.S. Army and 39 years as an Arizona trial attorney. He has previously owned a retail computer business and an Apple Macintosh software company. James has over 32 years experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Genealogy Star blog and rejoice and be exceeding glad. He served for 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa, Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. He has presented at expos and conferences around the U.S. and Canada. James has seven children and 33 grandchildren. Howdy, this is James Tanner and welcome to another BYU Family History Library webinar. Uh, remind all those listening that these webinars are recorded and available on the BYU Family History website, uh, Family History web Library website, and also on the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. So if you go to youtube.com and type in BYU Family History Library, you'll come to the BYU Family History Library webpage. Uh, welcome to the webinar. This Today we're going to talk about using Google for genealogy. Um, I would, you know, I think I would characterize Google as being uh, the best known, little known program that is on, on the internet. Uh, this, this is especially true for genealogists. Very few, uh, in my experience, very, there are very few genealogists who are uh, what you would call computer um, ad, uh, ad, addicts, people who are just glued to their computer day in and day out. There's some of us, of course, who are, but there are many who uh, who kind of look at the computer as being an adversary rather than something that they need to help be helped with but uh, Google is one of those programs that uh, is sort of in the background you're always thinking about it and you've always used it for searches maybe you do maybe you don't have it for your default search uh, there's plenty of competitors out there but um, it is one of those programs that has a, a tremendous amount of depth and we're going to go through some of the the very, very useful things that you can get from using Google programs for genealogy. Uh, first of all, of course, we're talking about google.com. Um, there um, uh, there's some difficulty here because uh, people have, you need to understand that there's a difference between a program called a browser, which runs on your computer, and a uh, and the program that we use to search on the internet. Google is a search engine. It also has a browser program called Chrome. Uh, to make things even more confusing, it also has a number of computers that they call Chromebooks, and it has an operating system that they call the Chrome operating system. So all those things together are kind of like family search using family tree after everyone else is using family tree. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyway, so uh, but we're talking about the search engine portion, the online version. Uh, the, the browser that you use uh, could be Chrome, it could be Firefox, Safari, um, uh, any of the number, any number of other um, browsers that are out there. But uh, if you set up Chrome, excuse me, if you set up Google as your primary or default search engine, uh, then it will always come up to Google Chrome. If you're on a, a different computer, like for instance, if you buy an Apple computer, it often comes with Safari as the default search and you have to switch over and use Chrome. So here's, excuse me, use uh, Google. So let's move on here. Let me kind of review, give an overview of the different programs that we're gonna talk about that come from Google. We have Google Books and Google Play. These are two parts of Google. Uh, and we'll talk a little more depth about these. We, of course, we have YouTube that I've already mentioned as the place where we are 
uh, uploading all of these webinars and all the other presentations that we've been putting together here at the BYU Family History Library. And then we have Google Image Search, which uh, uh, basically this is the kind of place where unless you know how to do a Google Image Search, you're probably needing to cover your screen when you do it because you might get some things that you're not looking for. Uh, but if you uh, type in your search first before you get to the, the page, then you can usually control what, what comes up. Uh, Google Scholar, little known part of the Google program. Uh, this is a very, very useful uh, website for those who are doing serious research. Uh, Google Plus, um, kind of an alternative to uh, some of the other social networking programs. Um, uh, Google Plus has, uh, has gone up, down, and up and down in popularity, but it is a very, very uh, viable uh, program out there right now. Uh, Google Translate, indispensable program for genealogists, especially if you're doing uh, non-English uh, type of research. And we'll talk a little more about that also. Uh, blogger and blog search. Uh, these are the, uh, this is a place where, where most of, I would guess, the, the largest number of blogs is hosted on Google's Blogger. Uh, there is a, a uh, competing web uh, type of, of uh, blog writing and, and uh, creating programs called WordPress, and that uh, is. Uh, one of the ones that competes a little bit, but my blogs, for instance, are all hosted on Blogger. Um, <coughs> one more cough. Okay, Google Maps, Google Earth, and Wikipedia. Wikipedia strictly is not a Google program, but it works with Google Maps and Google Earth in very direct ways that I've covered in other uh, webinars and presentations that are up on the YouTube channel. So that kind of covers a little bit. Now, there are many, many more programs. I've just selected the ones that I think are most pertinent to genealogy. Um, there's lots of the others that I use um, all the time, but they're not uh, necessarily related directly to doing research in family history. Now, here's uh, the sort of minimalist uh, Google uh, startup page. Uh, usually they have a little graphic to celebra celebrate different uh, anniversaries. Uh, they're very innovative, uh, very entertaining, and uh, uh, we always look forward to the, the new Google. They're not up every day, but frequently they'll have a, a little graphic up there that helps to entertain us. You will need to register, sign in to Google in order to gain access to all of these resources. Um, Getting a Google account is free, um, and it also matches up with a Google Plus account if you have a Google Plus account. Uh, and it's, um, uh, you know, there you're either in the camp of people who, uh, who sign up for everything they can that might help, or you're in the camp of those who wouldn't want to sign up for anything because they're afraid they're going to uh, have their identity stolen or something else. And so um, there's really not a much I can say in this presentation that would persuade you one way or the other, but I would suggest that to take advantage of these tools, and they're free, that you really need to uh, be registered. Now, I might mention something about the word free. Understand that Google is one of the largest companies in the world. Uh, it, right now, it's large enough to negotiate directly with many of the national governments. Uh, it, it really has a greater income than many, many entire countries. And so when you talk about Google, you're talking about uh, a huge, huge organization that is basically run on advertising. So it is really the largest advertising co company in the world. And so when you go on to Google, you can be guaranteed that you're going to see advertising. You may not even realize that you're looking at advertising but what you see a lot of times is, is advertising. So uh, just be aware of that. And uh, if you're living in the modern world, and particularly if you're uh, finding yourself online frequently, you need to start building up uh, 
huge amount of sales resistance and, and a, an ability to ignore all the advertising that goes on. Uh, okay, so where are all these programs that I just mentioned? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, if you look up in the upper right-hand corner of the Google screen, you see a little uh, grid of the black squares, and uh, that is the link to all the programs. So clicking on that link brings up a list of some of the Google programs. Now, I mentioned that I didn't even conclude all of these, so I've skipped things like uh, Gmail and Drive and Calendar and Google and uh, Photos and News and all sorts of other programs. Uh, but there is a, a link at the bottom of the page uh, to even more of these programs. So if you click on that, you get another set of programs and then even more programs besides that. So here's another set, Shopping, Wallet, Finance, Docs, um, Contacts, My Business, Hangouts, uh, all of these. And then there's an even more list that lists uh, about between 30 and 40. It changes from time to time. Uh, they they merge programs together. They uh, they discontinue programs. They add programs. Uh, just sort of seems to be sort of randomly, but I'm sure that's based on on their statistics of the use of all those very various programs. Now this is the even more page. Uh, so they're in categories, and what I would suggest is that you go to this page and explore. Um, there are some things on here that you may really be interested in, might help you in ways that have nothing to do with genealogy, uh, but you may be very, very interested in in, in uh, utilizing some of these programs. Um, of course, we here at the, the BYU Family History Library have made ample use of the YouTube program because that's where we're parking all of our of our webinars and presentations. Okay, so we're going to start out with Google Books and Google Play. Uh, Google Play is the subscription kind of program. It, it, you don't have to pay to, to, to own it, but it is the way that you get uh, the Google products, meaning uh, things that are for sale through Google. Um, it's the rough equivalent of the App Store for um, for Apple or the Microsoft Store uh, where they sell their apps. And Google, of course, developed the Android operating system that's used widely on, on cell phones and uh, tablets throughout the world. And uh, the Google Play is the outlet for all of those and any of the other products that Google sells to, uh, to end customers. So and the, the other part of Google Play is that uh, you can create your own Google Play account on uh, Google, and then you can use that to store um, electronic books and or magazines or anything else that you want to load up to uh, the Google Play. So it becomes a place where you can actually park things. Uh, as part of this, uh, and I didn't mention it as being important to genealogists, but you might want to consider it, is Google Photo. And Google Photo uh, introduced uh, a, a service of storing an unlimited number of photos. Well, I had about, you know, I, don't re I, I can't really estimate it, but it's probably close to uh, 40, 50,000 or more photographs. And so I just decided to see if it, what would happen. <clears throat> and over the course of about two weeks, while it sat there on my computer, it uploaded every single one of my photos, which are now totally available to me on my phone and on my tablets and any place I want to look at every one of my 10,000 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50,000 photos, however many. I don't even know. I haven't ever counted them. I've never even added up all the numbers and all the hard drives. So um, basically... Uh, now, Google Books is a, is a different product. Uh, Google Books is where Google <coughs> has been digitizing books, and they have over 32 million plus books. Um, one of the things about the Google Books project was that when they began this, their goal was to digitize every book that had ever been published in the entire world. Well, they've estimated that there are about 230 between 230 and 240 million books that have been published. So they have probably a little ways to go before they get them all. But 
they're not just pub uh, scanning them in English. They're all over in every other language they can find, libraries and all sorts of things of books that they've scanned. But <clears throat> unfortunately, from Google's standpoint, they got sued uh, in the United States for copyright violation. And that was quite a few years ago. Well, without going into a long story in the details of that copyright uh, case brought by the uh, Authors Guild and other other plaintiffs, uh, as eventually that case worked its way through the, the federal district court and into the federal court of appeals where the court of appeals ruled in favor of Google and denied any of the, the plaintiff's claims and also, of course, awarded Google attorney's fees against all these people. And then they appealed to the Supreme Court, which denied review, which means that the, the court of appeals decision is the law of the case for Google's. And so Google Books, basically, uh, everything they've done so far has been ratified by the court as part of what we call the fair use doctrine in uh, copyright law. So uh, Google Books probably will continue to expand. It's, a, it's been a very good project for Google. Uh, there are uh, lots of books out there on here, and it's a good place to search for genealogy books. The last time I did a search on Google Books for genealogy as a topic, I had almost 8 million books show up. So uh, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of books out there to look for. And uh, I would suggest that uh, uh, you might want to look at Google Books. It's a separate part of the program. And what, when you're doing a search in Google, of course, uh, they're looking through everything. And they might find the books. But those of us who have been doing Google searches know that you can sometimes get a million or two million or five million or more than that. Um, results from any one search. Uh, and the books don't necessarily show up near the top. Well, to force all those books searches up to the top of the searches, <coughs> Google has its own section called Google Books. And Google Books are um, basically, um, it, this basically searches directly into all the books on the program. Uh, when you're searching here, uh, oh, well, the last time when I did this, I came up with 1,660,000, you know, give or take a few million. So there's a, there's a lot of other books here and publications on genealogy. Uh, when you put in the search terms here, what I would suggest is that you search for every name in your uh, genealogy database. Actually put in the names, and a good way to do that is to put in the name with uh, in between quotes. So if I were searching for my great-grandfather, Henry Martin Tanner, I would search for quotation mark, open quote, Henry Martin Tanner, close quote, and perhaps throw in a, uh, a modifier or two, uh, like Arizona or Pioneer or whatever, and then use the search to search for books. Uh, you're going to be very uh, surprised, I think, when you find out how many books there might be about some of your ancestors uh, that you'll find here in Google Books. Um, OK, now we're going to move on. And we're really going to have to continue to kind of move through these programs uh, without going into a great, lot of, a great deal of, of detail. Google Image Search is, uh, I mentioned, uh, could come up with some things that you're a little bit unexpected and maybe you don't want to look at. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, it's extremely valuable from a genealogical standpoint. Once again, you go up. This one is actually on its own in a menu item at the top of the uh, Google search page. So it's not in the little block. Uh, actually, I think it's both places. But there is a separate link out there to Google Images. Or you can just type in images in the Google search, and it will come up first as the uh, selection from a Google search. Uh, you get the same thing you do with Google Books. You get a separate search page. This one's called Google Images. And I would make exactly the same suggestion that I made with Google Books, and that is that you put in the names of your ancestors. I'd search for surnames. I'd search for places uh, that your ancestors lived. I'd search for your ancestors' names individually. Uh, including any of their nicknames or uh, abbreviations. So with my 
great grandfather Henry Martin Tanner. I'd also search for Henry M. Tanner, Henry Tanner, uh, perhaps uh, other uh, names if I found those to be appropriate. And uh, then uh, that would, uh, in most cases, people are very surprised at what they find here and uh, doing a, an image search. Now, let me show you an example first. You can search by subject or you can e also upload an image to find a similar image. So if, you're, uh, if you have a, 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 an unknown image that you're not aware of who this is or where this place is, you might try just uploading it and someone else may also have the same image and have identified it. Uh, so it's a very interesting way uh, to, to uh, identify unknown photographs. <clears throat> um, so if I put that information in there, like I put in, for example, the subject of saguaro cactus out of Arizona. Um, we used to have one of these growing in our front yard uh, before I moved up here to Provo, Utah. And uh, I got all these different pictures of saguaro cactus. Uh, some of them from old books and some of them, uh, you know, newer pictures. Uh, I may even find a few of my own pictures here. Uh, that's entirely possible. Uh, on the other hand, if I went in and searched for images by the surname, uh, I could get uh, historical or historical places where your ancestors lived. You may come up with something different. Here I searched for Tanner, particular, specifically for Henry Martin Tanner, and I found all sorts of references here to Tanner and historical places associated with the Tanners. Um, down here in the corner, I found a picture of one of my relatives that I had not seen previously. Uh, and these photos that come up in uh, are, are all over the internet. First of all, you have to be careful uh, not to violate copyright by downloading and, lose, and using a copyrighted photo. But when you're talking about old photographs like this, the historical photographs, um, usually those, if they're before 1923, especially they're out of copyright and in the public domain. Uh, but in any event, it's a good idea to look at the website that the programs came from to see who else, who uploaded the photo. That may give you the name of a relative in addition to that, if you, uh, they may have information concerning the copyright status of the document. Now, the other thing you're going to see on this view is a lot of documents, uh, death certificates, uh, anything that was uploaded to the internet as an image and, it, and attached to a website could potentially show here uh, through a search for your ancestors. So it's incredible. Uh, very interesting thing to work at a little bit and put in some names and and things if you're looking for um, for graphics. Uh, now on the side, not directly related to genealogy, uh, since I write a number of blogs uh, and keep them going all the time, I use a lot of uh, and a lot of presentations. The graphics that come out in my presentations come from Google Images, and in that case, I can I can um, filter them to those who, which are specifically um, allow, which is specifically allow reuse. And so I uh, choose documents that are clearly in the public domain uh, primarily, or if that is, uh, you know, if I find something that has uh, a restriction, usually it's limited to what they call attribution. That means <clears throat> I have to identify where I got the photo. And so I put a little tagline at the bottom of my photos showing where, I, where they came from, which is all that's required for, the, um, for that particular license. So <clears throat> they're a really good in place, but you've got to be careful with the content that you copy. Uh, it's very easy to find the copyrighted documents here because they're coming off of all sorts of websites. Now, we're going to switch gears here and talk a little bit about Google+. I mentioned that it's, it's uh, in a sense, a, another place to go for a social networking program. Uh, it, is, uh, it was started some years ago, and uh, a lot of the ge genealogists initially uh, migrated into Google+. Uh, there was a good reason for that, because at the time, 
uh, Facebook was um, uh, it was in I would say in the annoying category. Uh, there were so much other things going on on Facebook that it was difficult to focus. Now Facebook has evolved. Uh, Google Plus has evolved. Um, I, I am not so certain that um, uh, that there is a um, you know any particular difference between the two for uh, from those from those standpoints. Um, before I go on, though, let me ask her a question that's come up on the computer. It's uh, how can you tell if a photo has been copyrighted? Uh, the the um, that's the difficulty, and the only thing you can do is assume that it has been, unless it's specifically said that it is not. Uh, so the burden is on finding that it is that someone says that it is not copyrighted. If it were if it was taken before 1923 then there is no US copyright, but there may be a foreign copyright if it's a foreign foreign photograph. But um, so the answer to that is simple. You can tell because unless it says it isn't, it is. <laughs> um, and that's been my rule for a long time. Er, the US law and copyrights charged in a, changed it back in the 1980s. We, adapt, we adopted what was called the Berne Convention which uh, made a copyright in the United States uh, automatically attached to every single created work. Uh, and so uh, regardless of whether there's a notice or a little C copyright or anything, everything that comes out today is copyrighted. So just assume it's copyrighted unless it actually says it is in the public domain and is specifically or specifically has a, a license for use. OK, going back to Google+. Plus. Well, OK, so Google Plus is an interesting thing. There's lots of interest groups. It's uh, actually a really good place to talk to people. Uh, one of the things that uh, I use Google Plus for is to, uh, as, a, as a way of talking directly with other people uh, through what you would call chat or texting, where you're typing in things into the computer and it's being sent to them instantly. Uh, I have. Uh, I was in a, a different, another webinar for, a, for actually this one was for Find My Pass this last week, and we used Google Plus to talk back and forth to each other during the course of the webinar with the people who are running it, because uh, I was not on their location. I was sitting in my computer in my home, and they were wherever they were across the world, probably in England uh, or some other place. So uh, that, that's uh, Google Plus also has something that we'll get to called uh, Google Hangouts, uh, which is, is another type of, of talking back and forth through the, through the program. Um, so Google Plus is organized in circles. So you can create as many of these interest circles as you want to. And if you think of them as circles of interest, you, you need to add one more thing, and that is their filters. So if I want to see only my friends and my family on Google+, I can simply look at only those circles, and then no one else, nothing else shows up. Uh, so I can use it as my as sole way to talk directly to my family and friends. If you are on a program that's now become very, very popular called Instagram, you know that you can add people or not add people. Um, unfortunately, there's what I call uh, social networking creep, and that is not the creeps who are on social networking, but the um, the, the social networking where uh, we started out Instagram as being primarily aimed at our family, and slowly over the last couple of years or so uh, that we've been very much using Instagram within our family, it has been uh, it has uh, slowly acquired. Uh, quite a few of, of the other relatives outside of our immediate family, plus a lot of their friends. And now it's like everybody. Anyway, uh, that's kind of, but that can be kept from happening with a Google Plus because you can simply turn off everybody else and never see them. Uh, and plus you get, uh, you know, from time to time, you'll get in, invitations to join, uh, to have somebody be uh, in one of your circles or be your uh, your contact or whatever on Google Plus, um, 
there's no obligation to, to uh, add them back. In other words, you don't have to make them your friend. They can watch you without you watching them. Um, I was adding a lot of people in as uh, watching back uh, simply because I, I was gathering a lot of genealogy people. Uh, then I got started getting uh, all sorts of extraneous people uh, on there, and uh, so I kind of discontinued that practice. I mostly uh, add people very selectively now to Google+, but of course I have like three or 4,000 people on there, so it's a little bit different for most people. Okay, so there's your circles for Google+. And then you can create communities. Um, that's an interesting thing. And actually, some of the Google communities have turned out, Google Plus communities have turned out to be uh, extremely uh, far reaching and viable in the area of genealogy. Uh, there are some very, very, very active uh, special interest communities where people can confer about research items on a specific location. I'm thinking of the Ohio research community. And then there are other people who have maintained other special interest communities uh, that are associated with um, uh, a particular product or a particular group of people. And it's worked very well for genealogists. Uh, it seems to be a, a very viable place to, to uh, be involved directly in social networking. OK, we're going to shift gears again here, go into a different group that we talked. I br briefly mentioned blogger, bloggers. Um, I've had some interesting uh, observations over the last year or so about blogs. Blogs, were, uh, blogs are, are essentially mini we uh, websites. Uh, they're, they're free. You can maintain them on Google. In fact, uh, if you run Google Ads on your website, on your blog, uh, you can get paid uh, a little bit for having people uh, actually click on you the ads. So you can get like a penny a piece or less for each click and things like that. And, uh, you know, it's nice every once in a while, every three or four months or so, get a check from Google for $100. Um, it it doesn't, doesn't hurt your life any. Uh, some people don't like to have advertising on their blogs and they don't have to. Uh, they can not have that. Uh, so it's uh, it's an interesting one. The blog search part of this is a way to search blogs directly, just like the, the uh, uh, Google Images and Google Books that have spe specify, uh, specific uh, targeted search engines. So the blogs are um, free, limited websites that, uh, and there are thousands of genealogy blogs out there. Um, one of the things that I've noticed, as I started to say a moment ago, is that blogs <clears throat> require a little bit more commitment and are a little bit more involved than just simply on put posting on Facebook or uh, taking a little photo and adding a two-word or five-word ca caption on Instagram. But uh, I've seen a real steady erosion of blogs, um, uh, just from my own family's involvement. For example, uh, at one point, I think uh, with all of my uh, children and, uh, and the other close relatives, we had in excess of 30 blogs uh, that were being maintained. I would guess that less than a half a dozen of those are now active. Um, and, but if I go to Instagram uh, right now, if I were to switch over to Instagram, I would find all of my uh, family members posting uh, all sorts of things all over Instagram all day long. Uh, photos of everything from chickens to uh, mountains to sunsets to kids to everything else there is out there. So uh, you really kind of, if you have a feel for social networking, you'll know that, uh, that, that Facebook is sort of the, uh, the king of the social networking mountain out there. Uh, but uh, that these other, uh, the other things that are going on, and blogs are definitely uh, becoming very specialized and um, are, for the most part, actually commercially based. People who have things to promote commercially are very, very active in the blogging area. Almost every genealogy company uh, that is in business has a blog. Um, so you can go out there and find a lot of information on blogs, 
and specifically information about genealogy and uh, the products. Uh, so there's, a, uh, you know, there's, there are lots and lots of blogs out there. Uh, there's, of course, going to be somebody who says, well, why aren't you mentioning your blogs? And that is, uh, I don't think this is a venue for publishing, uh, for publicizing things. Uh, they're out there. If you put in my name, you'll find uh, that I'm, I think I last, I don't remember the last time I checked, but I've got thousands and thousands of returns on a search by my name and genealogy. So you can probably find me out there. Uh, I am going to mention the Ancestor Files. This is not a commercial blog. This is my uh, uh, daughter's blog, but it's, it's an excellent example of a genealogy blog. My daughter is a professional writer and historian, and she has maintained this blog uh, for a long time uh, with information, stories, uh, photos, and everything else. If, you, if you're interested in, in uh, communicating with your, your uh, family, this is an excellent way of doing it because over the years that uh, my daughter has been involved in the ancestor files, we have received a, a huge number of records and uh, histories and diaries and photographs and all sorts of material about our family that we would never have found had we not been online uh, all the time with, uh, with these kinds of, of publications and the blog. Um, you can get a little bit overwhelmed with blogs. Uh, I think I read uh, on the average of every, uh, I'm subscribed to about 287 blogs. That was the last time I checked. Um, basically, there are programs called readers or aggregators. And what these do is they organize your subscriptions. So you can watch a whole bunch of different websites and they will then put that information into a format that looks like a news uh, listing with the headlines. And then you can read the headlines and uh, save yourself uh, a lot of grief. They work through what's called a RSS feed. It's a really simple syndication feed. And uh, almost all websites and um, blogs out there have the ability to support a reader. So. Uh, let's say my daughter is posting a new post on the Ancestor Files web uh, blog, uh, then that shows up in my reader, which I am using a reader called Feedly, which is part of Google, by the way. It's a Google pro product. Uh, it's F-E-E-D-L-Y. -E and Feedly is uh, a blog, and then you can just um, subscribe to almost any website out there. Anytime there's a change in the content, it will show up in a list like a list of headline list uh, telling you about the changes in that particular uh, in all of the blogs that you're subscribed to. Um, so people say, well, I don't know how you manage all that information. And the answer is, uh, I don't really have to spend that much time going through uh, the, the, the aggregator or the reader to determine whether there's something that I'm interested in reading it more in depth. And it looks like this. This is the little icon that comes up for uh, an RSS feed that is, if it's on a website or on a, on a uh, blog, uh, then that means you can subscribe to that blog. Although I, I, I've, this, the way of, of subscribing has been evolving. Uh, it's a little more complicated from the programming standpoint, but it's a, a lot simpler from the user standpoint. And you used to have to go through quite a, a little bit of technical steps to, to become a, or watch a blog or to have it in your reader. Uh, but today in Feedly, all you have to do is click on a plus and put in the uh, address of the, of the website or the blog that you want to subscribe to, and it will automatically do everything for you. So you don't have to really go through any kind of complicated stuff to subscribe to blogs. Uh, here's a... Uh, uh, what it looks like uh, today. This is a, a screenshot from Feedly, uh, and it's feedly.com. And you can see that it uh, you could scan through this pretty quickly. You just scroll down through the page. Uh, it wouldn't take very long to look at 25 or 30 or 50 or 100 or 150 of these little uh, bloggers, depending on how fast you read. Now, if you don't read very fast, it, it may take you a while. 
uh, here's the list of the blogs on the side. Uh, you can see all of the uh, uh, all the blogs that uh, with the number of open um, unread items. Um, the only the only catch about this and and having as many as doing as much of the subscriptions as I do. It's kind of like in the old days, if you were subscribing to newspaper and you went away on vacation, you forgot to stop the newspaper and you come back and it's your whole front yard's piled with newspapers. Um, this is the same thing that happens with uh, a reader like this. Uh, if I, if I for some reason get distracted, which if I leave for a couple of days and I'm off the internet, uh, then uh, when I come back, I could have three or four or five hundred or even a thousand feeds, and I uh, basically give up at that point. Um, I just have to admit, I just click them all, mark them all as red, and start over again, because there's usually no way I have the time to go back through all that, all that stuff. So here's the subscribe button, and then you add your subscription, and it comes out in your, uh, uh, in your feeding list. Um, usually what I do is I have a link uh, to uh, Feedly up in my browser bar. So all I have to do is click on the link and it takes me directly to the, the program. Or I could actually have a, the, the app on my uh, phone or my iPad or, or my tablet and, uh, and read them all on, on, uh, on those devices. Okay, now we're going to move into Google Translate. Um, beyond, uh, I guess, if in, in some circumstances, I could I could characterize Google Translate as being the most valuable program on Google, uh, at least for those of us who don't speak all of the 64 different or 68 different languages that they uh, they translate into. Um, Essentially, Google Translate can be set up so that it automatically translates any page you go to, no matter what language you you go into. So if I'm doing, I do a lot of my in my research, I do a lot of different languages because I'm I'm working with a lot of the patrons in the library, and I'm also uh, helping people uh, all the time with their genealogy, and so. Uh, I may be looking in German, I may be looking Polish, I may be looking in Czech or into Russian or Ukraine or any place uh, if for languages and for genealogy information. And once the Google Translate is enabled in, in your browser, uh, when you're using Google, uh, if, you, if you do a search for uh, Danish records, for example, and it comes up with all of the Danish language websites, uh, then it will usually pop and say, do you want to translate all this into English? But I can just do a setting where it will automatically translate everything that comes up anyway. So I am essentially doing searches in English, even though they're coming up in all these different languages. And there's usually a link at the top of the of the browser that says, uh, view in the original language, and so I can look back if I want to look at it in Swedish or, or uh, whatever other language that I want to, to actually see the, the translation in. So how does it work? Well, it comes up with a little uh, box. This is the basic program. Whatever you, you type in the uh, left-hand box in that language, and you can uh, specify the, the language, will come out in the other language that you specify. So I'm able to carry on conversations with people who send me messages in Russian and, and in uh, lots of other languages. Um, you know, and, and so I just translate it, and then I can see exactly what it is they have to say to me. Now, question about the translation quality. You wouldn't want to, to uh, try to, to uh, translate a novel using Google, Trans, Google Translate. Uh, you wouldn't want to do poetry, uh, Bible, things like that. Probably not. Uh, but if you uh, if you translate, uh, you know, if you need to know what's going on in the language, which is really what we need to know at the level we need to know in genealogy, uh, then we can translate baptism to baptism in whatever language, and christening to christening, and 
and uh, death to death and burial to burial and all that stuff. So uh, all that stuff, you can just start typing in a word list if you want to, and it'll translate everything into your language or their language. Okay, so if I type in something, and after I've chosen to from, and let's say I type in, hello, how are you today? I'm looking for gene I'm looking for genealogy. And then I have it marked over here in Danish. Then it comes out over there in Danish. So, uh, and another thing that's interesting about it is there's a little uh, a, a speaker down here and a keyboard. And I can actually go in with the keyboard and type all of the Danish alphabet and all the German alphabet and all the other languages. And if I click on the little uh, mic uh, speaker, it will say whatever I've typed in that language. So I could, uh, you know, now they have a, an app that they put on phones where you, you talk into the phone and it, spe it does speech recognition and then it repeats it back to the person uh, in whatever language. So if you're traveling, you can say, you know, where is the bathroom? And it'll say, it'll, uh, it'll translate that and let the other people. Of course, if they start laughing, then you'll know that it didn't work. But <laughs> that's, uh, you know, that's the, the danger of, of trying to say something you don't understand. Okay, so we're going here from English to Danish. And so that's what happens. Okay, now we're going to switch over to Google Scholar. Google Scholar is a is kind of narrow uh, category of, of things, but it's a good place to go to look for scholarly articles, academic journals, and legal documents having to do with genealogy. There are some. Be surprised. There are some some uh, academic uh, journal uh, articles out there. Uh, on those subjects, on maybe on the subjects you're interested in. When you do a, a search, it starts searching all those legal and academic journals and uh, comes up with a list of, uh, of articles. Uh, you know, let me tell you something that, might, that you might be at surprise. Uh, if you really want to see what DNA is all about uh, in having to do with genealogy, uh, put it into Google Scholar, and then you'll see what people are really writing about GNA. Um, that's kind of an interesting uh, exercise. But uh, in this case, what it does is it automatically creates the citations. Now, if you're doing uh, formal research and you need to, to add citations, then this is an excellent place to go to create citations. There's some other ways of doing that, by the way, WorldCat. Uh, .org, and uh, there's also a program out there that's got nothing to do with Google, but it's called Zotero, Z-O-T-E-R-O, and it's Zotero uh, is another one that creates citations. So there are lots of others, uh, but the uh, but this is one that uh, is very very expansive because Google uh, searches out all of these different uh, things, and there's a little uh, circle there showing where you click cite and it and it creates a copyable citation that you can use to create a bibliography or whatever else you were doing with it. Okay, now we've made it to YouTube. Now, YouTube has a bad rap. Uh, it is, uh, you know, full of, uh, of all sorts of, uh, of videos uploaded. The number of videos being uploaded to, to Google uh, YouTube is uh, like, oh, I don't know how many thousands of hours every second or something like that. I mean, it's ridiculous that the number of hours of video that are being uploaded faster than anybody in the world could ever view them all. Uh, but what is, what is surprising is that YouTube has become, like Wikipedia in a sense, it has become the go-to place for looking for information. So if you want to know how to change a tire or replace an air conditioning unit or uh, you know, build a, uh, a gazebo in your backyard or something, you go to YouTube and you find somebody who's already done it step by step and shows it in a video on how to do it. Um, uh, I once had to change the, the battery in my Prius and uh, I had no idea they wanted to charge me like 300 bucks to do that. And I didn't, that kind of offended my sensibility since I couldn't, I could figure out that I probably could change a battery. And uh, so I went to YouTube and looked at the, and found the instructions. Well, same thing applies to genealogy. Um, so if you have, there are thousands of genealogy videos. And obviously we're putting, we're adding to the number because we're putting up uh, a number every week of new 
of new material here from the BYU Family History Library. So uh, you go on there, and every major company out there has videos. Uh, if you want to go watch Family Search videos, or Ancestry, or My Heritage, or Find My Pass, or any number of other companies out there, uh, they all have their instructional videos, and their promotional videos, and their news videos, and uh, there's just all sorts of things out there. You can learn how to do just about anything by watching YouTube videos now. So uh, here's the BYU Family History Library uh, website. I think this screenshot was done uh, about the time that we had barely, barely started putting up. Um, no, this is it's relatively new, actually. I must have updated it. So. Anyway, so we're basically putting up new ones all the time, and you can subscribe. Uh, there's a, a link over here on the side uh, of where it says subscribe, and you can uh, subscribe to uh, the, the BYU Family History Library. And if you are registered on Google, uh, you the program will send you an email update uh, every time a new video is loaded. So a uh, good way to find out what's happening, what's going on, uh, and I recommend that you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Now, if I were going to, to uh, characterize one program, even outside of, of genealogy, that was the absolute most valuable thing that Google has ever done is Google Maps. I think Google Maps has basically changed nearly the way everybody in the whole United States navigates around the country. Uh, there are other mapping programs. Apple has one, Microsoft has one, uh, Bing, and uh, um, there's uh, Waze and there's other mapping programs out there. But I would think that you know most people are out there using Google Maps. And it is, and along with Google Earth, which is a free program now, it used to be a very, very originally it was, they had a pro version that was for sale. They've incorporated everything into the same program and made it free. And they both work with Wikipedia to find almost every location on the face of the earth. So when I, uh, just within the yesterday, I was helping uh, uh, someone here in the library uh, and we basically figured out that uh, the place that recorded for, the, for her ancestor was wrong, and it was all done through Google Maps and searches in Wikipedia. So um, this is just, it's just an invaluable tool. And I, I routinely recommend that people search for and verify every place they have in their family tree. Every mention of a place needs to be verified. What I find is that there is just especially in online uh, family trees, there are very, very frequently that, that the, placed, the places are either misidentified or they're wrong. And so they need to, you need to get into the maps. Um, we'll be having some uh, webinars in the future on maps, uh, getting into more details. Uh, we already have done a few. And I would suggest that you get into the idea of searching all this information. Now, you'll find maps up there under the little black uh, squares up in the corner of uh, Google. Or you can just type the word maps into Google, and it will always come up first uh, in the search. So it's pretty easy to find. Um, so once you have the maps, uh, then you get uh, the map of the location where you happen to be. And, um, uh, People are always kind of surprised that Google knows where they are, and the answer is uh, any computer that is, goes online uh, is basically able to be located. Um, I think if you watch the TV shows, you find out quick that, uh, especially the detective shows and things, you find out that they are always interested in cell phones because they can trace quickly trace where somebody is with their cell phone or where their cell phone's located. Well, same thing works for computers, folks. Um, so they know where you are. And uh, so they'll look up your place. And uh, you can see at the bottom that there's pictures. Uh, there's also some very interesting things. Uh, you can go to what's called Street View. And in Street View, you can look uh, at drive, uh, do a virtual drive down any street. Uh, People, I, I, it, it just, what's one of the most amazing things to me 
is that people are still amazed when I show them Street View. It's like, <laughs> folks, it's been around for a long time and I can't imagine that you haven't used it or understood that it was there because uh, it, you, even if you have no interest in genealogy, this is one way to figure out how to drive someplace because you can actually do a virtual drive and see how where this house or this building or this office is located before you drive there. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, uh, it's an amazing uh, help. But for genealogists, it's invaluable because you can go look at all the places where your ancestors lived uh, and uh, look at the houses. I recently uh, was going through some of my documents uh, and I ran across uh, an address of where my, uh, from in a letter that my parents, my father had written, of where we lived uh, when I was, uh, when he was in school. And so I popped the address into Google Maps, and then I went to Google um, Street View and uh, got a picture of the house where I lived when I was like three years old or four years old or something like that. So anyway, this is, uh, this is not only interesting, it's an invaluable tool in identifying and helping to identify your ancestors because... In many cases, people with similar names can only be differentiated by very, very specifically identifying their, their physical location of some event during their life. Um, is this is especially true for countries in Scandinavia, Wales, England, uh, you know, a lot of places in the United States where people have similar names. Um, so, we have the two programs. Google Maps is primarily for locations and identifying locations. Google Earth is primarily designed to provide information about all those different locations. Um, you know, you can get wrapped up in both these programs, but Google Earth especially, if you start looking around at, uh, you know, possible vacation spots and things like that. They get distracted from doing your genealogy and looking out there at the world, you know, South Sea Islands and things like that. Well, um, on the other hand, you can also plan uh, genealogical research trips. And both of these programs let you um, design and um, implement your own personal uh, map. You can uh, create your own map uh, with all the way spots, all the, dif all the different uh, locations that you want to look at or you want people to look at. And you can then even share those maps with other people so that they can uh, follow your, your vir virtual tour with your information. So if you wanted to show your, your ancestor's immigration route or his crossing country route or something, you can do that and build that in uh, either Google Earth or Google Maps with uh, their, their specialized tools. So they're very interesting. And here's uh, Google Earth with all of its um, uh, different uh, geographic and um, all types of information, weather from weather to volcanoes on this, on this program. And also maps, old maps uh, that, are, that are overlaid onto Google Earth to show you locations. Uh, one of the most uh, helpful things today is that you can actually take some types of files. They're called KMZ. That's Kilo, Mike, Zulu files, and they can be overlaid on Google Earth to give you uh, time-sensitive historical information like boundary changes for count counties and for uh, national and state boundary changes. So here you are. You can download Google Earth to your computer. It runs in layers. Uh, you can turn the layers off and on. Uh, there are so many different kinds of layers and things that you can implement. Uh, use with Google Earth that it is uh, somewhat mind-boggling and, and uh, pictures, photographs, all sorts of things can be added to, uh, to Google App. In this case, as I mentioned, you can also overlay historical maps. In this case, David Rumsey maps on the David Rumsey map site. Uh, in some instances, some of those maps have already been overlaid on uh, the Google Earth website. So they stretch them uh, accommodate those maps. There's also other programs that do the same thing. Uh, New York Public Library map program does this, and then there's a number of other programs out there that overlay maps onto uh, the, uh, the most recent things. And I mentioned Street View. 
uh, you go into a town and click on the street view and it will bring you up. Uh, we're going to have to kind of move quickly here through this last part, Google Docs and Dr Google Drive. Google Docs is a set of programs, uh, word processing, uh, spreadsheet, presentation program, uh, and some other uh, similar, you know, related programs that are free online and you store all your information up online so it's available from any computer or device. Um, I use this extensively. I move between an iPad Pro and my uh, iMac and my uh, the computers here in the library and all sorts of other places around and that is extremely uh, helpful to have all of your documents available and searchable and and uh, you can sit there and edit and write and do whatever, no matter where you are. Google Drive is actually the place where all of those uh, documents are, are stored. And uh, you're given one terabyte of free memory on Google Drive. Uh, you can also upload, as I already mentioned, all of the photos you want for free. Uh, they don't go against your Google uh, drive uh, allotment so you can put up thousands and thousands of photos and share those if you wish to do that or not. Um, so basically this is, uh, uh, you know, there, there are some tools here that you would probably be very interested in using. Uh, you might want to, to go to these. Uh, most of the, of the word processing, commercial word processing programs have also gone to an online version. Uh, Microsoft has their Office 360, 365, I think, that is the, um, uh, the, their online version of what is now with Google Docs. So you're going to get this. Adobe has put all of their programs, Photoshop, uh, everything else up online. There's also an opportunity here to do collaborative editing. You can, uh, if you create a document, you can invite people to work on it and edit it. Well, that uh, sort of wraps up the, the quick run through overview of our, um, of Google and its uses for genealogy. Um, thanks for listening. Oh, we have a question. Okay, well, quick, we'll do a question. What's the question? Um, who is, was David Rumsey? David Rumsey is a private map collector. Uh, he created a website. Uh, presently, I don't know the total number, but it's way in excess of 30,000 old maps on his website. They're all freely accessible. Uh, so if you put in a search for David Rumsey maps, you'll find his website immediately. It's also featured on many other websites out there, uh, such as the uh, Digital Public Library of America, uh, that's dp.la, uh, and other places. Uh, very valuable old site. His website allows you to search through all the maps and look at uh, every place uh, geographically out there. So good place for, for map information. Um, OK, reminding you all that this is a BYU Family History Library um, Web webinar and that the uh, webinar will be posted on the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel and we'd invite you to subscribe. Thank you much.